Welcome to World Extreme Medicine. If you're a doctor, nurse, paramedic, or other healthcare professional with a strong sense of adventure and a desire to learn and explore the world, then you've certainly come to the right place. My name is Mark Hannaford. I'm the founder of World Extreme Medicine. In this episode, we're talking to Dr. Lucille Chavonneau, who works on a remote tropical island in the South Pacific in French Polynesia. Lucille, it's, um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you join us here um, at the WEM Academy and, and the WEMcast um, podcast series, series that we have running. Now, you're a, a doctor, you're based in Tahiti in French Polynesia, but it's French Polynesia. Um, could you quickly just introduce yourself to, um, to the community? Hi, Mike. Um, it's a real pleasure to yeah, um, I'm yeah I'm a, a French doctor actually currently working in French Polynesia, which is part of France, but which is on the other side of the planet, in the middle of the Pacific, and um, I'm based like uh, in Tahiti and in Moria, currently in Moria, which is an island nearby, and have been working also in different islands through these last years. And you're based. Um your role as a, as a GP in, in French Polynesia, I imagine, is quite different to the traditional role of a, of a GP, be that in England or in France or in Europe. I, I hear you're quite mobile in your, in your job. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, I'm, as I said, in, in the island of Moria, which is a, a tiny island, but still one of the biggest here. We are almost uh, 17 um, thousand of people which is huge uh, here at least um, <clears throat> but I sometimes go like last week uh, go to help on other highlands um, last time I was in Huayne which is a, an, an under the wind uh, island which is small again and um, as I work here as a, an island duck or doctor but um, the work in itself it, it's quite different than what we are used to do because it's a mix in between GP and emergency doctor and sometimes pre-hospital care and <laughs> uh, palliative care and <laughs> all that in the same in the same job and um, so that's what I'm, I'm currently doing here um, so the type of work I do is um, consulting during the day and um, at night we are the only doctor for the island um, so we have to deal with pretty much everything and anything. Uh, it can be a little thing, but it can be a trauma or, or huge um, uh, illness. So, and it's also quite different because we, we deal with um, some pathology we don't have uh, in France, for instance. I've been working in France and in the US. And, uh, you know, when I start uh, working here and there is... Uh, I mean, tuberculosis is everywhere, but it's a lot here. And leptospirosis too. Um, they used to have leprosis, small and um, small parts, and uh, dengue fever, and <laughs> used to have Zika also. And so you, you have to get used to that because he has fever. He can either have dengue, he can he either have um, a leprosis, um, leptospirosis, and you you know, so that's that's kind of different. Um, what else? What else? <laughs> well, how have you, and I don't want to um, talk about this too much, but how have you been affected by COVID? Well, we've been, we've been very lucky actually, because as we are, we are part of France. So um, the directive came, came the same. So we closed the borders uh, at the same moment that it has been done in France. But um, the, the spread of the disease was later as, later arrived in, in French Polynesia. So we closed the gates <laughs> quite early in, in the story of the, of the spreading uh, here. And I mean, we are islands in the middle of the Pacific. So like weeks of sailing before anything arrived. So it's, it's like a quarantine. You, you, you live from anywhere else and you come sailing, you have already done your quarantine. <laughs> so, but, but it's been actually a, a huge deal because, um, as it is always the case with places that we describe as remote, we are very linked with the outside. And, um, and everything, not everything, but a lot of things arise from New Zealand, uh, US, France, and everything was shut. 
so uh, no tourist but uh, Polynesia it's a very touristy place Bora Bora is very well known and so when when you close uh, the fr frontier and you don't have tourists it has been a, a it, it has had a huge impact on the economy that is for sure but also on everyday life here because people ended up with no work at all and mm -hmm. um, it's been a, a huge thing to to deal here because um, so we had the confinement and but it was it was even uh, stronger than it has been done in France for instance we all, all we also had what we could couvre-feu I don't know what is the name in English it's mean that at one time in the evening okay. nobody is allowed out yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. uh, after 8 p.m. nobody was allowed out so it's kind of you know it's a huge thing and we had no um, we were not allowed to buy not sell alcohol for more than a month and a half so there were no alcohol ever be at everybody at home at 8 p.m and nobody allowed to go anywhere with no permission uh, drink quite a while and um it, it has um as a doctor i mean it, it has been the the same in in different places with different colleagues in other country we we had to work a lot in organizing the whole thing fearing yeah. the worst and and it has been lucky but tough also you know to prepare for the worst and it's it's not coming we, we, we had cases but but we managed to um, make it smaller i don't know we had few yeah. cases and we could follow and, them and, yes exactly, exactly. So, so that that was lucky for that. But you know, in, in a, a very small hospital that we have, uh, we we had to um, separate in two pieces, like the COVID side. Well, suppose like COVID side and the normal side. Actually, it has been done elsewhere, but we 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 feared a lot because um, the way it works here, we we don't have uh, the family unit is is quite different than in France. Um, under the same roof, you have different family unit living like the couple of the parents and the couple of the grandparents and the couple of the uncle and the aunt and maybe five children among, among them. And so it's like nine or 11 people living together. So we, we had to organize uh, that because when you, are, you suspect someone, you're just like, okay, so you stay in a room and you don't talk to anybody. Okay, but how <laughs> how is it going to happen so it was interesting to work with uh, the community to uh, work also with with uh, the country to to plan uh, all that part and to try not to have the same thing that we we have had in other pacific island uh, a, year, a year ago for instance we were afraid that because for two months everybody was confined uh, kids for example won't get to be inoculated with the vaccines and if that is not done for i don't know half a year uh and it is the first half a year of the babies and they won't be covered for you know all the all the pathology we know and we don't want it to happen like it happened in samoa's island with a huge spread of um of disease among among kids last year so, so that, that was our, our work, <laughs> trying to prepare for what's coming next, not only for the COVID part. The, um, and I, I imagine that you're, well, in fact, I imagine lots of people um, thinking about your job as a, as a sort of a GP in Tahiti, have a very romantic vision of what that might entail. And I'm sure some of it is absolutely lovely. But on the other hand, there are there are there are some realities of working remotely like you do that people probably don't so easily um, become aware of. I imagine in your role you have to take a lot of make a lot of independent decisions that if you were working back in a European setting, you would be able to you know, ask a friend, speak to a colleague, reference somebody else. How does um how 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 do you deal with that? Does that cause you quite a lot of stress or you know, has your training and experience given you the tools to deal with that quite easily? It is something that come back often when we talk to practitioner um, in remote island. And I said practitioner because it's not only doctors. Um, as I was saying, um, in some islands among the seven 
72 inhabited the island. On some, there is only a nurse or only an assistant of healthcare who deal with the thing. And, and them, as us, when, when we talk to them, what is very hard for them to deal is sometimes when something happens, they don't have a colleague, you know, someone who understands the, the field that they can rely on and just talk to or just, you know, empty their head like, okay, I've got that, that, that to say, you know? And, and it, it is very tough because even, for instance, you know, in the middle of the night, um, you are the only dog on, on, the, <laughs> on the island and you've been working like your, your 20 hours and it's the last hour of, of your shift and you have someone who, because you, you are always balancing, yeah, is it like really, truly an emergency and I'm going to call a helicopter? Or is it okay uh, that I can wait for the next boat and for the next, you know, whatever? And that, that is very, very hard because it's your decision. It's something you haven't learned at school because at school you just want, oh, you have a dislocated elbow? Okay, you go to an operating room. Fine. <laughs> and and it's, it's not going to happen. The, the last one I saw uh, came from an island when, where there is no um, airport. So she had waited like three days before coming to my island, which is not even the biggest hospital. And she has the elbow like swelling, like huge. And um, so, you know, you, are, you have to make the ch this choice that you haven't been um, talked for of, okay, it, how, um, what is the level of emergency? Can I cope with it? Can I stay with? Or I have to send in, you know, very, very quick. And sometimes you're alone. I mean, we, we tend, I'm lucky enough in Maria at least, um, I can call um, the other doctor. They are not on call, but I know that they will answer because we are uh, very bond. But, um, you know, sometimes you just call them, is the regulator? I don't know who you call that in, in, in oh. English. I mean, it's the guy in the main hospital who received all the calls from everywhere and who decide whether to send uh, pre-hospital care, whether, you know. So sometimes I call him and I, I remember last time I was just like, okay, I've got this lady, she has that, 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 that. I'm worried because there is this um, thing that worried me, like in her condition. And, uh, and I don't quite know. And it was just like, yeah, but what do you want me to tell you? What, what do you want me to tell you? What, what do you think? What do you want me to tell you? And it's like, actually, I just need to speak to a colleague, you know, because just talking about it to a colleague make me think properly, but I have no colleague right now, <laughs> right now around me. So, so that, that can be that can be tough. And as I said, um, we we had a colleague who on who came because she, she was. She wanted to do that and she did it for two weeks and lost five kilograms and said like I'm not doing it I just can't it is too stressful and when you have a, a situation like that how do you how do you deal with that um, and I know yeah. you've, got a, you've got a particular interest in in human factors I mean do you do you use that sort of um, training and um, interest in your everyday practice and, and helping colleagues and helping yourself in your daily practice I try to actually. I was uh, <clears throat> in France. Uh, I'm involved. I'm a co-founder member of a of a group <coughs> called uh, Factor Humain en Santé, which is human factor in healthcare. Uh, because in France, we are quite late um, in comparison of uh, other English country, <laughs> English speaking country at least. Uh, <clears throat> and um, and so we we are a group of professionals, but not only doctor. We are. Uh, doctor, we have um, a security director of um, a nuclear power plant, um, a pilot, uh, air controller, uh, all these people who have um, experienced um, the managing of um, human factor. And yeah. we, we focus on how it's going to be done in, a, well, in the healthcare field. And it's very interesting because we have a... We have a lot of trouble <laughs> working on that, especially with doctor, because when you tell to, to a doctor uh, that's a mistake or that's an error, he, he heard that's a fault. You know? Yeah. There, there is no in between. So I'd rather not to speak about mistakes, do as if it doesn't exist, uh, and keep, keep moving on rather than really saying that, okay, that's, that was a problem. and it had not had any consequences, but better work on it now. And um, so even if in a small structure here where, where I'm working, 
I'm, I'm trying to put that um, into practice and, and it, it worked quite well actually with true simulation and and through um, debriefing, debriefing and debriefing also. Uh, and it's hard because as every new practice, you have to make it like systematic. Uh, but I find that like, people are quite um, un interested in it, interested in it. Uh, and, and that's good. It's, it's always a bit frustrating because, you know, when <laughs> you're trying to work on, on things, uh, it, it's hard for people to think that they are not judged and I think that is the, the biggest problem with human factor. It's hard, you know, to make people uh, feel uh, safe enough uh, to be okay. We say everything because we're not judged, you know. So sometimes it's like, okay, so on this intervention, uh, can you say what, what has been well, what, what we have been good at? And there's few things. And okay, so what are the things that we could be better or that you didn't understood or, and no word. <laughs> I'm just, just, just trying, <laughs> but but it 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 works well, and I'm always uh, very happy and happily surprised. Um, how things can emerge, you know, from how things you wouldn't have think about can uh, rise from different point of view. So, yeah, that's that's on on its way. I would say we've got some uh, great videos on something we call the the Wem Academy. Um, which I'll send you links over for because some of them are, are really quite uh, powerful sessions and I think you'd find them interesting. Now, um, the question I uh, like to ask is, you know, with the fact that you're working remotely, the fact that you have to problem solve you probably more than you would in a hospital, you have to um, make decisions by yourself, you have to be a good team member. Do you think that actually has made you a better clinician as well definitely <clears throat> definitely because um sometimes you don't have the choice I, as i was saying you have to decide whether it's uh, it's an emergency right now or in a day or maybe in two days so in in some places where when, when i was a, an emergency doctor in <clears throat> in france for instance in a, in a big hospital where i had everything even an mri if i wanted uh, you know, sometimes it's like, uh, okay, I don't really know. Okay, let's scan it. Let's scan him. <laughs> you know? yeah. Okay, he, he has a pain in his stomach. Well, I don't know. It's it's like 2 a.m. Yeah, scan him. <laughs> you know, and, and, and actually no, because even I, I don't have blood sample in, in places. I just have the yonogram and, and that's it. So <clears throat> you have to be, and, and we have a lot of key actually, in semiology, if, if we really take um, the time to, to do a clinical exam like well, <clears throat> you, you can learn a lot of things that, that we have been used not to um, t take into account because we have other, other things available. So we have, well, we, we use now um, the ultrasound, which is kind of really nice also, but, uh, but yeah, definitely it has made me um, a better doctor and also weirdly, you know, sometimes when, even when I work now in situation when I, where I have more, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do more. I'm not going to do, you know, I'm wondering, well, okay, why a blood sample? Like, if there is that result, I would do that. And if there is not that result, I would do exactly the same. <laughs> so, you know, what, what am I doing here? And I think question is, questioning ourselves this way, help us also be a better doctor. And I think... Um you know, something you brought out there was actually your detective skills and your listening skills and your examining skills are all much more finely tuned because you're completely reliant on them for your medical senses in a way that you're not in a more organized system, organized system, more, uh, more well-equipped system. Mm -hmm. Now, I know from speaking to you before, Lucille, that you've got quite an eclectic uh, background in terms of your medical experiences in terms of getting to where you are now do you want to just run through for people who would love to do the job that you're doing you know your pathway okay <clears throat> my, my pathway as a, as a doctor and even before <clears throat> as i said i was raised on an island in new caledonia which is a tiny island also uh, and then i was sent back to france on my well last year of high school and then who 
straight into med school in Paris, I was 17. So you can imagine also the big shock when you spend like <clears throat> the last year of your teenagehood in an island in the Pacific and then you end up in med school in an amphitheater with 400 people <laughs> who doesn't understand you and you're in, in Paris and you're just like, oh, that's huge. I'm going to take the train for one hour going back home. That's weird. But uh, that was a bit like that also, you know. <clears throat> I mean, even if I was born in France, I didn't know well. And so I, I, I did my med school in Paris, in La Pitié Salpêtrière, which is a very big, uh, very big um, hospital. And I was lucky, I, you know, you only realize that later because during this year of, uh, of med school, I was, I think I was kind of a nerd, you know, I, I never not, not learned something. I will, I will know, you know, very well everything that I've been taught. And, uh, and actually you, you only discovered later that, oh, well, that helped. You know, last time, even yesterday, I I, I saw a page and I was, you know, uh, Reckling God and Syndrome, I was like, oh, well, yeah, I know that. I've never seen it in my entire life, but somehow in my head, it was stuck. <laughs> so <clears throat> I took the time for that. And um, and then I, I chose to specialize as, as a GP. Um, and so I decided to, to go south for that. I start, I first went for a rotation as a resident in Philadelphia. I was a, I was a UPenn student. Um, and, and then I went back to France and specialist, uh, specialized as a GP. After I specialized as a GP, I um, applied to do emergency medicine, which is two year courses in application, you, you have you know, application field and study also. <clears throat> so two more years. And, um, and I, went, I went back to the Pacific. Um, in the meantime, I, I started um, uh, ex expeditioning, I can say, um, because I've, I've always been going out and I had a, uh, something I really like is teamwork. I, I, I used to love uh, play basketball and rugby and, and, you know, a team is something, it's an interesting unit and I like to work as a team. And uh, expedition is about that also. And, um, and so, uh, first time I went to Greenland with a friend who's now a professional photographer, Florian Ledoux, and, uh, and because for a photographic expedition. And I was there on the East Coast, a tiny and remote a settlement of people, some, sometimes 300, sometimes the biggest, 1,050, where there is a hospital, and on the others, none. And, uh, and it's only fjord, and you can go uh, by helicopter from... If it, if it goes through the wind and everything, but you can take an helicopter from a base to another. And I was with an Inuit friend when I came back alone and I was with an Inuit friend and we were on the, on the I don't know, in the middle of the town. And there, there was this huge board when they displayed information and that I couldn't understand. <laughs> and I was asking him like, what is written? And he told me like, yeah, the doctor is coming next week. I thought, wow, okay, does it come often? And he told me, well, twice a year and I was like wow uh, what, what struck me wasn't that he was saying like only like twice a year but because he wasn't saying like only twice a year do you imagine that was just a fact <laughs> and I, so I wondered I mean like what what is important what is the need and what is it that you feel that it's enough or not enough you know in, in the dispensing of healthcare. And, uh, and I wanted to study that in Greenland and I was supposed to go back there next winter and finally I didn't. And I had applied in South Pacific and I got in. So I flew back for six months, that became a year in the, in the South Pacific, Tahiti, uh, in, in, in an area, well, a huge area, sure, but of the world that I had known as a, as a kid. And, uh, and I just realized, well, the weather is not the same. The temperature are definitely not the same people either. But still, the problematic in terms of healthcare is a little bit similar because you've got islands in the middle of a huge sea, which are all linked in a way, but, but also very remote. And, um, and how do these people deal with it? With illness, with health, with uh, fear also. Um, with need and uh, and so that's how I decided to to realize the research. So I I conducted um, a qualitative study there, um, so a, a research kind of ethnographic, uh, kind of anthropological too, on the experience of healthcare. Um, 
what is it you value? What, what is it you need? I mean, what is the meaning for you of healthcare, of good health, I'd rather say? Because if the aim of us all is to have someone in good health, then rather stick to his definition of good health because the, the way you experience your health is as important as, as the way you are, um, basically, you know? And uh, in, in places where the means are, are limited because not a lot of people, not a lot of practitioners, not a lot of technology there, uh, <laughs> better be close to what they experience as needed. So, so I went on two archipelagos, um, so five islands, and I met there the elderly, old people. Uh, I would just really walk, <laughs> walk in and say like, hi, I would like to talk with the Matayapo, the, the, the old person. Uh, that's right. And they, you know, when you ask them before, like, yeah, there is this doctor, this doctor, she wants to talk with her, she, they will be fear, uh, fearing something. And the, when you are there, just sitting next to them, to just speak. <laughs> they just speak, and they, they are just so happy to do that because it's the way it has always been, like the old people speaking and talking and teaching to the young and um, telling stories. And, and so it, I, it fitted in what I was looking for. <laughs> so I'm... I went there and it was funny enough because, you know, some, I remember like on a tiny island, there is no airport on this island. And this man, had, uh, he was 97 years old, which is kind of, <laughs> kind of impressive. And, uh, and I, I speak to him and I was talking, I was talking about Rahu Tahiti also. Rahu is in, is in um, is medication. So they call like Tahitian medication. There is a prepared. It used to be something that, uh, belong to a family so it was not really one person knowing all about the the plants and how to prepare it it was more about families um, giving them knowledge of a preparation through generation and when you needed to be cared uh, cured for something you will go to fetch it in this family and this family so it was kind of an exchange and you'd rather be um, in you know like uh, not in um well, quite happy with the other family, otherwise you won't get it, you know? And uh, <clears throat> so he was telling me that he used to prepare it and, and I, I asked him, Do you, um, did you give it to someone? Uh, because in this, in this where it, it actually it's in the Polynesian language, it's kind of the same, but uh, giving it, it's like uh, transmitting it to, to someone. Uh, did you give it to, to, to someone? And he was like, no. Why? Do you imagine like all these things you know are going to disappear because nothing is written? It's it's not it's an overall culture. It's not it's not written, and uh, <clears throat> and it was like well because nobody just come like you do and sit next to me and listen, and it was just like you know yeah that's so such a shame <laughs> you know so he told me a lot. This man it was, it was super fun and uh, and so you know, they, they were sad. So I was lucky enough to just sit and listen to them. Uh, truly, they wouldn't give it also to someone who does, on, who does not deserve it. There is this, you know, you, you have to deserve or to have the mind to, to have it. But, <clears throat> and, um, and that's also how I, I realized that word of um, meaning uh, further than just the word, the word itself. I mean, in French, we use the same word in Polynesia that in France, but still um it, it doesn't have the same consequence for for this guy for instance when well the whole study showed also that uh being in good health or health doesn't have the same um meaning i mean when i asked my resident or colleague what, what is it to be in good health i would always say it's having no illness <clears throat> while people the other that would never say that they would uh answer like yeah it's when it's when i'm good and i can work it's when i'm good and i can go to church basically when i'm not um dependent when i'm able to take part of the life of the community when i'm able to do that and um so, so that's been very interesting because then you can be ill and in good health you know what i mean and uh <clears throat> and and this guy, uh, he had seen his taute, he had seen his doctor and uh, this old man. <clears throat> and I said, like, he used to um, 
take care of all this guy, all this guy that you can imagine, like nine to seven. And he was still, you know, like cutting the grass little by little. <clears throat> and, and I said, yeah, but you're not doing it anymore. And he told me like, no, no, the doctor told me that I have to rest. I have to stop working. I have to, I have to rest a little. And, and it was, you know, it struck me at this moment because what, what's the meaning of rest and don't work meant to him was just like, it's done, you know, it's, it's done. You're disabled, you old, you are dependent. And, um, and so we had to be, and we have to um, be careful of the word we use because even if it's the same word in the same language, linked to a culture or linked to a translation or whatever, it, it's, it might sound different. It has a very different interpretation. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so that, that's what I did. So I did this research, uh, published on it, loved doing it. But I, you know, it's always when you do research, it, it's always the same things like, oh, wow, I've got a great idea. Oh, no, it's like, it's, it's like super bad. I know it's not, it's never going to happen. And you find somebody else. Yeah, let's do it. Because I think it's no, it's going to be no, it's not never going to work. And then <laughs> you, know, you just jump from a thing to another. And Finally, it worked, and uh, and then I went back to France for two years, and I worked there as a as a senior doctor uh, in emergency, really like only emergency field and pre hospital care because in France um, pre hospital care is um, a nurse and a doctor together. It, it's not a, a paramedic or medic, which is kind of special, uh, and so I was <clears throat> doing it for for two years. I did some other research on on again kind of remoteness but in France <laughs> and um, and then I, I, I specialized in aerospace medicine always being very interested in um, crew actually crew team and how it work uh, so I did it in Paris with uh, Professor Marotte which is, uh, which is awesome <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and yeah I've never practiced in a, as an aerospace doctor because uh, as soon as I finished I flew back to French Polynesia, where I'm actually now working on an island as a remote doctor sometimes. And yeah, that's, that's where I am here now. <laughs> and Lucille, do you think, do you think you'll stay in, in, in Polynesia or um, is your plan to come back to Europe or what are your, what are, what's your next plan? You know, it's, it's funny because, um, I knew when, when I was, first time I went to Tahiti, I was 13 years old and I was in the, in the middle of the market and I told myself like, I'm going to come back. I know I'll come back. It took 10 years, but I came back and then I left again and then I came back again. And, um, there is, there is something like that. Um, and you know, I really like here because also I've been raised in this kind of things, but I think it's also part of the island life to move, you know, islanders move, go to another place and come back and go to another place and come back. And I am, I am so, somehow linked to the Pacific as I am also linked to France and to the US where I've been working twice and <laughs> I just loved and to England even when I, you know, and it's, it's kind of weird because I've never, um, I haven't been raised in one house in one place with the same people and i've been i've been moving all 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 the time and it can be a bad thing because somehow you, people wonder but where are your roots you know where, where do you but on the other hand i can move and i think islanders work maybe also like that <laughs> and i think you can um decide that you want to make roots and then you can put down roots that's it's not a prerequisite for happiness. Uh, and if that's something that, you, that one needs to do, then that's something you can decide to do. Um, Lucille, what would you um, give? Oh, no, actually, no, I'm asking uh, two more questions. In terms of the job that you do, what do you like best about it? People, I would say. <laughs> I <laughs> think that might be your answer. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it has always been I think uh, it's frustrating medicine wait, I remember when I was younger someone told me like when you work for people you are always, always at one point frustrated or disappointed and that's true I mean as a doctor we always are you know when something doesn't work when 
people doesn't want what you're offering because it happens all the time, <laughs> especially here. It's like, yeah, in my book, it's written, you have to do that and that. And they look at you and say, I'm not going to do it. Okay, I know, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, people, because then there is only one moment with one family and you say like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here right now and I'm at the right place. So that, that's, that's the important thing. And, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of expedition doctors and one of the things that um, they repeat over and over again is the fact that they're, they're practicing the medicine that they imagined they were going to practice when they started their medical training. And often when you get into a hospital environment or more controlled environments, you know, the reality between what you imagine it to, to be and what it is in reality is different. But when they do expedition medicine, that is the reality of what they dreamt when they first started doing medicine as their degree. <laughs> it's funny enough, but it's actually, it's true. I think, you know, I remember even when I started med school, really, um, for, first I was 16 before I entered and I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a doctor. And this lady told me like, why are you going to waste yourself in medicine? <laughs> I was so disappointed. I was like, yeah, well, that's what I want to do. Okay, I, I didn't have the profile I, at all because, you know, you are supposed to learn everything by heart and, and my field was more like literature and I used to speak French, English and Spanish and write Japanese and all that. And it was like, yeah, that's not going to be useful in anything. I was like, I don't care. I'm going to do that. So, but um, I, I wanted to do it. And even when you do, you adapt yourself when you're working hard, and especially in the beginning of med school, because the first year of med school, you're only doing um, learning by heart, uh, physiopathology, and you're just like, what am I doing here again? Uh, that's not at all what I had planned. And you're just like, you're stuck to it. But in the end, I, I, when they asked me, I was like, yeah, I want to be an emergency doctor. I want to, I want to work with team. I want to do expedition. I want to, um, you know, go in places remote and I want to be able, what I really wanted was to be able to deal um, and to go in a direction or something with anything that happened. It doesn't mean that I am able to take care of everything, just that in front of someone I can tell, okay, I think that's more like that or that's more, that's just people we're going to send him to. Um, and and that, that's what I wanted to be able to do. I, I didn't, I never wanted to be a specialist, which is very nice. I mean, there is great thing to do as a specialist of Nagan, but, but that wasn't my view of being a doctor. And um, once again, when, you know, when you're in med school and say, yeah, I want to be an emergency doctor in France, they look at you like, really? Why do you want to kill yourself? You know, it's, it's, like, it's like that. Like, yeah, and finally you do it. And, and I'm here and I'm, I'm it's, it's not the end. I mean, it's not yeah, I'm at the place or I'm doing exactly what I want to do and that's it. It's not like that, but I'm doing something I, I was aiming for, you know? And, uh, and, and I did expeditions and going always northern, always uh, coldest, <laughs> colder and colder. And you end up in a tent, it's minus 30 and you're just with friends and it's like, yeah, you know, guys, if it wasn't with you, I think I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know I can hear some people that are going to be watching this thinking Greenland, Tahiti, Greenland, Tahiti. I don't know which way they're going to go. Yeah, but that's also how we are all, you know, like paradoxical. And uh, so, yeah, and sometimes, you know, there is people who, I remember someone contacted me on, you know, or I don't know which what it was, like Facebook or Instagram, whatever, and, uh, and asking me like, yeah, you know, I was, I want to, uh, I, I'm 30 and I, I want to change my life. I want to work as an, an explorer and live from adventure. Uh, so what, how do you do, how do you find money? And, and I was like, well, actually I did like 12 years of medicine to, <laughs> to be, you know, you know, I was like, okay, it's not, it's not about, okay, I want to be an explorer and I want to live like that. No, and what, what do you have to offer? You know, what, what do you have to, what is the meaning of it all? You know, what, what do you want to, and there is plenty of, uh, of sense to put in it, to, of uh, meaningful things to do, you know, uh, but still, fine, fine, find one, do it for 
so uh, reason also and um so well yeah i think i went from one thing to another to another but <laughs> i hope i i answered your question well clearly it's a journey like a, like life is a journey but it and it's making sure and i think isn't that the um the secret almost to happiness is following your interests not listening to the naysayers and the people who, who would have you conform or do something else it's actually following your passion because if you're doing what you're passionate about and what you would do otherwise for your pastime then actually that's what that's what you know, life becomes pretty good then what would you um for a young doctor or young medic um aspiring to do the work you're doing what would be your top tip what would your be the your one suggestion to them um i would say that there is not one way there is not one way there is a will there is that uh, i want to do that i would love to do that and there is multiple ways to reach it um i would say that it takes time and energy also so you'd rather do something you believe in otherwise it's hard to spend time doing it and uh <clears throat> yeah um i think it's just you have the aim and then you find the path it, it's not it's not going to be like okay i just have to apply in that you are building up yourself with little pieces in that makes sense later you know like coming back to french polynesia and finally i come back a third time to work here or you know um taking part in um in human factor and then i can apply and you know things i just build little by little and you have to yeah build yourself up <laughs> you know i get asked often how um is there a career in expedition medicine is there a career in remote remote medicine and of course actually in reality there isn't a career what it is is finding opportunities taking advantage of opportunities and building your own story and that's the really interesting thing about expedition medics is they have very individual and very uh, personal stories about how they got to where they where they got to and the opportunities aren't obvious, as you as you said. You have to go and find them. But if you're really interested in this type of medicine, then actually, when you find one, you suddenly discover there's a whole gamut and a whole plethora of opportunities. You now, once you open that door, you know the lights are shining. You just need to head towards the light. Very true, <laughs> Lucille. It's been a, an absolute pleasure to um, talk to you. It's been slightly confusing with uh, t trying to work out our timings because you're a whole day behind. And that's kind of a bit of a, a bit of a, a messing up with my head. But it's been an absolute pleasure. You know, hopefully we'll get to see you again very soon. The WEM conference, which we'd love to invite you to, unfortunately this year is probably going to be digital. But what we would love to do is get you involved with that, but also get you to come and join us in Edinburgh uh, the year after next and get you to present on your career and life in French Polynesia. You know, and as a tropical medicine doctor as well in the environment you're in. But thank you for your time today and uh, have a good day. You, you're just getting up and I'm just going to bed. So, but it's been, uh, yeah, <laughs> lovely talking to you. Yeah, pleasure was mine. I was super glad meeting you here and speaking all, about all that. <laughs> Thanks, Lucille.